Good morning, and welcome to the third lecture in our 2021 series. I am Ann Hargraves. Roland Kuchel and I are co-chairs of the summer lecture series. We owe thanks to the Osher volunteers and staff who have been working for months to make this series possible and to Dartmouth's conference and events team who have guided us through the technology. We owe thanks also to our underwriters, Caldwell Law, Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, Kendall at Hanover, The Village, Wells Fargo Advisors, and to the sponsor for this session, the Hanover Inn. Let's give them all a round of applause. Be sure to thank them if you run into them around town. Now, some housekeeping details. We ask that you direct your questions to us through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will accept questions during the speaker's presentation and during the break. Closed captioning is available. If you would like to turn it on, just click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. If you encounter technical difficulties, please email osher at dartmouth.edu or call 603-646-0154. Again, those contacts are osher at dartmouth.edu and 603-646-0154. Our speaker this morning is William Fry, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution and Research Professor with the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. A prolific author, his most recent book is Diversity Explosion, How New Racial Demographics Are Remaking America. Please welcome William Fry. Welcome, uh, thank you very much, Anne. I really appreciate uh, this invitation to talk to this, uh, this group uh, about uh, the changing face of America. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today draws from my book, Diversity Explosion, which is a book which looks at the changing uh, racial dynamics, especially since the uh, turn of the century, uh, because we're uh, moving into a new century, which is gonna be very different with respect to diversity. I think we're feeling this already. Uh, and uh, it's important, I think people understand the background for this. Now I'm a demographer, a lot of times people uh, hear that a demographer is gonna talk and they sort of say, oh, well, you know, demographers aren't very exciting, they're kind of geeky. And I hope to counter that image, uh, maybe. Uh, so uh, in any event, I, I wanna be able to, to talk to folks here about what's going on and why it's important. We're, we're getting out the results of the 2020 census. Some of the results have come out already. Uh, the most important ones are yet to come out in the, in the, the weeks and months ahead. So uh, what I'm gonna present here can't show those results yet because, because they're not out, but I think we have a pretty good idea what's going on and I wanna sort of uh, deal with what's, uh, what you should, you should bear in mind. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, the America's diversity explosion to begin with, uh, then I'm gonna move into talking about millennials as a bridge generation. I'll say why that's really important. And then I'll talk a little bit about diversity and presidential elections. Uh, the presidential election, of course, uh, last November being the most important one, but diversity has played a great, a, a big role really in the last four or five presidential elections. I wanna sort of say a little bit about that. And then again, sort of to wrap it up, I'm gonna say a little bit about what the 2020 census has already shown and what we might expect it to show. So uh, this is kind of the idea. Uh, you know, uh, we're at what I think a pivotal period in America with respect to race and ethnicity. Uh, we're moving from the 20th century, really the last half of the 20th century, which is dominated a lot by a white baby boomer culture and moving into the 20th century, which is gonna be much more racially diverse as we're already seeing, and it's gonna become even more that way. Now, now I'm an old baby boomer, as you might have imagined by looking at me. And I, you know, and I understand what the baby boomers have done in the last half of the 20th century, made big changes in terms of women's rights, civil rights, we're the Woodstock generation, uh, but we've also had some issues that uh, probably we don't, aren't so proud of as well. Uh, but we made a big impact on America in terms of, you know, all kinds of things, uh, popular culture, music, whatever. 
Uh, but that's changing. Uh, and uh, we see it every day. And as we move into the 21st century now in the second decade of the 21st, through the second decade of the, of the, 20, of the 20, 21st century, uh, America is gonna be much more uh, racially diverse, especially among the younger population, millennials, Gen Zers, post Gen Zers. They're going to be leading the way. And the more, the sooner we come to understand this, uh, the better off we're going to be, I think. Here is a chart which looks at the racial uh, breakdown and projected racial breakdown of the United States between 1970 and 2050. This is from the Census Bureau. And uh, the first bar in each one of these years shows the size in millions of the white population. These are whites who do not identify with any race or ethnic group other than whites. And then the second bar are people of color as the term is right now. Uh, and you can see up until very recently, the white population has dominated the United States. Uh, but the Census Bureau shows that between 2040 and 2050, uh, that's gonna change. And for the population as a whole, we're going to have a, a population where there's really no racial minority or no racial majority in, in the US. And we're sort of seeing all of that coming ahead. Uh, uh, if we look right now is where the US racial composition is. Uh, we're about 60% white. In fact, the numbers coming out from the census in the next couple of weeks might show us to be a little bit less than 60% white, uh, about 18% Latino or Hispanic, about 12% black, 5% Asian. So it's much different than we, if you'd have looked at this in 1960 or 1970, uh, or even in 2000. Uh, so we're talking about a very different and a changing America. And I think, you know, this may throw some people off a little bit, but I think the sooner that we prepare for this, uh, the better off we're going to be. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a few dynamics of uh, the racial change in America. One is the rapid growth of new minorities. Second, the diminished growth and rapid aging of the white population. Third, black advances and migration, reversal, and migration reversals and a shift to no racial majority nation. But I wanna talk first about new minorities. What do I mean by new minorities? Uh, I, I sort of talk about Latinos, Asians, and people of two or more races. Now you might say, well, Latinos and Asians have been around for a long time, really over a hundred years, more than that. But, but the fast growth of Lat the Latino and Asian population is really why I see them as kind of new minorities, much more dominant, much more influential nationally than they ever been, have never been before. Uh, they've accounted for four fifths of the nation's growth over the last 20 years. And if we look at this chart, you can see that uh, the, the last three bars represent the growth between 2015 and 2060. This is again, Census Bureau projections of the Hispanic population and the Asian population, both of which will about double over that period. And the, the two or more race population, the multiracial population uh, will probably triple and probably even more than that. I think we're gonna see many more multiracial folks and even the Census Bureau has projected as we move ahead. Now, a lot of people look at this, especially people who are a little concerned about how the country is changing and saying, well, this is all due to immigration. Well, that's not really true. Uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, about only 25% of Latino growth is due to immigration. The rest of Latino growth is due to natural increase, something we demographers call natural increase, which is the excess of births over deaths. Uh, so even if we stopped immigration, uh, Hispanic growth would be, be uh, considerable over time because of the births to Hispanics who are already in the United States. Uh, Asians are much more dependent on immigration, at least uh, for the current period, about 75% of Asian growth has been due to immigration. But for the most part, we're seeing a country where uh, we're going to be diverse no matter what the immigration issue is, but there are reasons why we should embrace immigration, and I'm going to get to that a little bit later. Uh, the second point I wanted to talk about is the diminished growth and the rapid aging of the white population. Uh, now, this is uh, something, again, that scares people a little bit, but there's a demographic reason for it. Uh, let's look at this chart again. The last part of the chart for whites shows that between 2015 and 2060, there's going to be a 10% decline in the white population. Part of that has to do with the aging of the white population. It's much older than all the, all the other groups so that there are more deaths and fewer births. In fact, right now there's what's called a natural decrease, more deaths than births in the white population. And that'll probably continue. Uh, but in addition, there's gonna be a lot of children of mixed race marriages, one white, one Latino, one white, one Asian. 
And those children are gonna be part of that other bar at the other end of the chart. They're gonna to add to the two plus race population, sort of uh, leaving the further decline of the white population. So for most kids born in America today, they're gonna to be living all of their lives or most of their lives in, a, in an American where the white population is declining either a little bit or a lot and rapidly aging. And that's why it's so important that we have this new growth of racial minorities uh, younger racial minorities to help our population gain. Uh, black advances and migration reversals. I think that uh, this is something that uh, uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit, especially the migration reversals. Uh, in years past, we've seen migration uh, of whites sort of take the lead in lots of places, but now blacks have been moving along in the same way. And the final part of it is the shift to the no racial majority nation, which I've talked about before. Uh, this is going to be something people have sometimes a difficulty in accepting. And uh, I think that uh, when you look at the demography, if you look at the way the country is growing, you're going to see that this is going to be so important, not only because of our, the nature of our growth, but all how we'll be able to become more uh, integrated with the rest of the world. Um, there are two ways we're going to be, that I'm going to talk about the increased diversity of the U.S. One is we're becoming more diverse by generation from the bottom up or from the younger ages to the older ages. And secondly, we're, be, we're going to become more um, diverse by dispersal from what I call melting pot areas spread out all, way to, all around to the rest of the country. So let's talk about uh, uh, diversity by generation. Here is a chart which looks at the racial composition of different age groups, starting at the bottom with the under age five population going up to the 85 and over population. And you can see that the under age five population uh, is about, this was in 2015, these data were taken, was about half white and half other people of color. You see 26% of that young population are Latinos in the US. But then if you move up to the 85 and over population, that's 82% white. And you see the white share getting larger as you get to the older ages or smaller as you get to the younger ages, however you wanna think about it. And in fact, uh, what I've got up there is something called a cultural generation gap. What do I mean by the cultural generation gap? What I mean is a lot of older Americans, people in my age group, in fact, uh, aren't very happy about this changing demography. Uh, they see it as a threat in some ways to them or their way of life and so forth. Even back in 2011, there was a Pew Research poll that said that among white baby boomers and seniors, more than half of them felt that new, new people coming to the US from other countries, especially from different backgrounds, were a threat to America's values, a threat to America's customs. Uh, and uh, you know they, they, you see this all, all over in, in, in various other surveys. This has softened a little bit over the last several years, but there's still this kind of changing view among the, this different view among the older population, among the changing uh, racial structure of the US. This is in comparison to the young population, millennials, Generation Zers, post Generation Zers, uh, who are very open to this diversity. They, they're engaged in interracial marriages, interracial dating. Uh, they're interested in, in policies that are important like uh, racial justice, uh, immigration reform, all of these kinds of things. Uh, so there's this kind of disparity. And this sort of spills over into politics. Uh, the political writer, Ronald Brownstein came, came up with this term called the gray versus the brown. And what he's talking about is that the voting patterns of older pop, the older population, especially older whites, uh, uh, are much different than those of the younger, fo younger folks. They tend to vote more conservative. They're more interested perhaps in lowering their taxes and not having a lot of government spending except maybe for social security. Whereas the younger population tends to be voting more liberal in many of these cases for more government spending, especially that might impact their raising of their children, their medical care and all of this sort of thing. Uh, so we're talking about a country where, you know, there is this cultural generation gap, but I think it's important to understand why the kinds of investments we need to make in the younger generation are so important for everybody. Here's another chart. It kind of flips the age pattern again, flips it in the other direction. That is, we have the ages going from the left to the right rather than from down to up. Uh, but again, this is for 2020. This isn't quite from the census, which is going to come out next month, but it's based on estimates that we think are going to be in the census. And you can see that the, the under age 10 population is 49% white. Uh, people under age 40 
right now, the oldest millennial is age 40. So everybody, millennials and younger, are pretty much racially diverse, much more racially diverse than the older population. The baby boomers, who are now ages 56 to 74, uh, are uh, you know 72 into the 70 percent white population, and a much more bigger a bigger Latino presence among this younger population. Let's move ahead. This is a kind of a low tech. Uh, animation. So watch carefully. I'm going from 2020 to 2035. You see that the bar has changed a little bit. And in 2035, uh, you know, everybody under age 40 uh, will be uh, more than half of everyone under age 40 will be a different racial and ethnic group than, uh, than Anglos. And if we move this ahead to 2050, we can see that uh, now everybody under age 50 will be a minority white. Now, um, you know, the Census Bureau does these projections, both I know and you know that we're going to have different kinds of racial categories by then, uh, probably more mixed, mixed race population and so forth. But this is to give you the idea, and of course, the further out the projections are, the, the less accurate they may be, but to give you the idea that certainly in the next bit of time, we're going to become much more racially diverse, especially among our younger population. And, and this is so important because uh, that older population is going to be depending on these younger folks uh, to invest into Social Security and to Medicare and other government programs and to make our government and our country more economically productive. They're going to be the labor force. And here's a chart which helps to understand that. Here's the projections in the labor force going from 2010 to 2030 uh, by different racial groups. Uh, and you can see that the white population, uh, again, this is from ages 18 to 64. So it's the late primary labor force age population. By 2030, uh, the last white baby boomer will be turning 65. So all of the baby boomers are going to be out of these primary labor force ages by 2030. And that's part of the reason we see this decline of whites in the labor force age population. But that's countered by an increase in Latinos and also increases by Asians and Blacks. So, you know, if we're thinking about uh, our future as a country, not just the well-being of people of color, of racial minorities, of immigrants, but our future as a country and to be able to sustain, uh, you know, our productivity and the kinds of social programs that are going to affect older people, we need to think about investing in this younger, much more racially diverse population because of the way we're becoming diversifying from the bottom up. So that was that part of it. Now I'd like to talk about the dispersal uh, from the melting pot parts of the country uh, to other areas. So this is the dispersing part of, of becoming uh, more, more, more diverse. Here's a map uh, which I put together you know, quite a long time ago, but it, it, it categorizes the country into three classifications of states. One are melting pot states. Melting pot states are states that house uh, high numbers of racial and ethnic minorities, the new racial and ethnic minorities, and particularly have big metropolitan areas that have been uh, magnets for them, like San Francisco and Los Angeles and California, or Dallas and Houston and Texas, Miami and Florida, New York City, Chicago. Uh, and uh, what I thought uh, was happening when I first looked at these patterns, and I started looking at this kind of immigration stuff uh, really in the late 80s and in the 90s, is that all the immigrants that were coming in or a good number of the immigrants that were coming to the US from Latin America and from Asia in particular, were staying in these melting pot metros, in these melting pot states. They were not dispersing out to other parts of the country. They did that because they came to join their families and friends who helped them get jobs, helped them acclimate to the US, uh, but there wasn't a lot of dispersion. Instead, during that same period, a lot of the native born population, whites and blacks, were moving to these other fast growing states in the south and in the mountain west and in the other parts of the west. You can see those oranger states, which I call the new sunbelt states. And then, of course, the rest of the country wasn't growing very rapidly at all. I call that the heartland. But when I started writing about this in the late 80s and early 90s, I was concerned that we were going to become balkanized as a country. That is, that all of these places that are becoming much more racially diverse would be seen as quite different than the by people in the rest of the country and they would suffer in lots of ways from politic from politics from distribution of resources and so forth and it wouldn't be good for the kind of country that we've always meant to be but i was wrong about this balkanization uh, as i look further at the data during the 90s and the 2000s really over the last two or three decades there's been a, a quite a dispersion of uh immigrants, but especially Latinos and Asians 
and then of course people of two or more races into other parts of the country, which is continuing, uh, which is good news. Uh, and it doesn't paint any more that balkanization perspective that I had before. Here's a map which shows the metropolitan areas with the highest growth in the Hispanic or Latino population between 10, 2010 and 2018. There are 138 metropolitan areas, green ones, which have grown uh, faster, much faster than the growth of the Latino population for the nation as a whole. Uh, and you can see they're not just places in California or Texas. In fact, a good part of them are in the Midwest and in the interior parts of the Northeast, places like Des Moines, Iowa or Scranton, Pennsylvania. A lot of these places don't have large Latino populations in total, but they have very rapid growth showing that that's gonna to continue to be the case going forward. I could do a similar map for the Asian population, which you would see uh, something, something going on in the same way. So there is this dispersion going out. Here's a map uh, which looks at all the 3,100 counties in the United States. And they're colored differently depending on which non-white group is highly represented there. And by highly represented, I mean that racial or ethnic minority group has a higher percentage of the population in that county than they do in the nation as a whole. So if you look at a lot of the green counties in Texas and in the Southwest and in California, uh, those, are, those are counties which have a higher than national representation of Latinos or Hispanics. The light green counties have a higher representation of two, two different racial groups like Latinos and Blacks or Latinos and Asians. And a lot of that is in the West and in the Southwest in Texas, but also sprinkled in other parts of the country as well. But I also want you to focus on the South. And a good part of the South has those red counties, which means those are counties with a higher representation than the nation of Blacks. Now it's not news to a lot of people that there are a lot of Blacks living in the South, but what may be news to people is that for the last 30 years or so, there's been a significant black migration back to the South from the Northeast, from the Midwest and from the West, sort of countering the great migration out of the South of over hundred years ago, uh, which is helping to make, to make these states grow more rapidly. The state of Georgia, almost half of the growth of the state of Georgia over the last 10 years is from blacks. Uh, so a similar high representation of the growth in a lot of the other Southern states, especially Georgia, North Carolina, Texas and Florida. Um, a lot of the Blacks who are moving to the South are young people, uh, as movers in general are, uh, but especially, especially Blacks with a higher education, with more than a high school education. There's also a movement back to the South of Black retirees, people who've worked their whole lives in the Northeast or in California or someplace like that, moving back to the South. Um, I've done some analyses of other racial groups, and I can tell you that, you know, compared to Latinos or whites, or other groups, who, who, some of whom are going to the South, Blacks are much more likely to choose the South as a destination. And some of it has to do with the history there, the culture there. Of course, some of it has not been a very good history, but they do feel more comfortable there. There's a comfort zone there. And especially in the New South, the places that have you know, growing economies, Atlanta is the number one magnet really uh, for Blacks where there's a, the large Black middle-class population, which is very attractive to younger people who wanna come there and be plugged in. So we're talking about you know, uh, diversity in general around the country, but you can see that diversity takes a different form in different parts of the country, uh, even at the county level, but certainly at the state level, what, what we're talking about diversity. Now you see there's a whole slew of counties in the middle of the country that are white. These are counties where there is none of the major uh, minority groups uh, have an overrepresentation or a large representation. Um, but the thing is, most of these counties are growing very tepidly or declining in population and aging, many of them. Only about 30% of the US population lives in all of those counties put together. The other 70% live in these counties where there are uh, you know, growth or high representation of people of color. So as we move ahead and we see that there are a lot of counties that are losing population, especially in the Great Plains, parts of the Midwest and so forth, the only way they're going to be able to grow population, to attract migrants, means they're going to be attracting young people and young people of color. So this is another way we're dispersing uh, in terms of our uh, increasing diversity across the country. Uh, can talk a little bit about um, integration and measures of integration in general. We all know that there have been melting pot cities over time. But more recently, in the last couple of decades, we're starting to have melting pot suburbs, much more racially diverse suburbs. 
There was also some reduction in neighborhood segregation, not a big reduction, but some reduction that we've seen in the last few decades. There is a very, very large increase in multiracial marriages and multiracial identity in the United States. And of course, we're also seeing diversity enter the political background. So I'm gonna say just a few words about each of these. I'll save the political background for more discussion later. Here is a chart which looks at the percent of metropolitan populations that live in the suburbs. And I have, it, and, and we don't have the 2020 numbers yet, but I have them up to 2010 uh, for the years 1990, 2000, and 2010 for the different racial and ethnic groups, whites, Asians, Hispanics, and blacks. Of course, for whites, most whites had lived in the suburbs already in 1990. That went from 74% of them up to 78%. Asians too, slightly more than half lived in the suburbs in 1990. That's gone up to 62%. Hispanics, half of them became suburban residents only in, only in 2000, 54%, going up to 59% in 2010. And Blacks, for the very first time in the 2010 census, showed a greater percentage living in the suburbs living in the, than living in cities. Now, it's true that when you talk about suburbs with a broad brush, there are lots of community in this, communities within the suburbs that have very different racial and ethnic makeups. But you know, the fact that this benchmark has been, has been passed, that now overall more Blacks are living in the suburbs than in cities is a big, is a kind of a significant event. And I'm, I'm waiting to see what the 2020 census uh, results will show. Many cities in fact, have been losing their black populations overall as a result of this black suburbanization, following a pattern that whites have been doing 30, 40 years ago or more. Um, here's, a, here's a chart about residential segregation. Uh, and this shows segregation levels going from 1930 up to 2010. Now, this is a segregation uh, measure between whites and blacks. Uh, many of you are in, probably uh, familiar with it. It's called the dissimilarity index or the segregation index. It goes from a value of zero to 100. When the value is 100, it means all the blacks are in one set of neighborhoods, all the whites are in another set of neighborhoods. They're totally separate. If the, if the value is zero, it means the same percentage of black, that each neighborhood has the same percentage of blacks as, in the, as the metropolitan area has. Uh, so uh, of course, we're not there yet. In any metropolitan area, we, we have complete integration or a zero segregation level. But you can see going back from 1930 to 2010, that segregation was very high, as you might expect, up through up through 1970, through all of the kinds of measures that that are well known, um, redlining and discriminate, heavy discrimination in the buying and selling of homes in, in various ways, and, and also in lending practices. Uh, of course, the 1968 Fair Housing Act at least made it illegal to do that in in theory. <laughs> it's not always in practice. Even today, we see some issues where that's not happening as much as it should. But it did have some impact on segregation levels. So you see between 1970 and 1980, uh, average segregation across metro areas went from above 70 down to a little more than 60. And now with a in, further into the 2010 census, even below 50, if you look at all metropolitan areas. But there's a caution here, and that is in many of the biggest metropolitan areas with the most African-Americans, especially in the Northeast and in the Midwest, segregation still remains very high. And uh, in fact, in, in Milwaukee, which of the major metropolitan areas has the highest segregation level, it's still in the upper 70s. Uh, a lot of the Southern uh, metropolitan areas, which received a lot of black migrants over the last 30 or 40 years, especially since the, uh, the this new black migration occurred. And, and since the changing laws, it says that new housing construction had to adhere to these new laws against uh, discrimination and the selling and renting of homes. Uh, those places like Atlanta or Dallas or Houston, while still high in segregation and low, 50, low, low 60s or high 50s, uh, have come down a lot from where they were before. So overall, there's been a sort of pervasive decline in segregation, but in a lot of the US, it's only been a very modest decline in segregation. Black white segregation is still very high, but we'll see more about it when the 2020 census results come out. Now here is a measure of integration, uh, which is much more, uh, I see optimistic, I can be optimistic about, and that is uh, the increase in multiracial marriages. This is a percentage of multiracial marriages of all marriages for 10 year periods and then going up to 2015. Back in 1960, less than one half of 1% of all marriages were multiracial. In fact, in several states, uh, black white marriages were illegal. Uh, as we move up to 2015, close to 10% 
of all marriages are multiracial, and about 16% of new marriages are multiracial. Uh, about 45% of multiracial marriages are between whites and Latinos. About 18% are between whites and Asians. About four out of 10 new Latino marriages are multiracial marriages. About four out of 10 new Asian marriages are multiracial. Not quite that high for blacks, but it is improving over time. So unlike segregation, residential segregation, which is coming down somewhat tepidly over time, interracial marriages are not. And this has a lot to do with younger people uh, sort of uh, finding people that are, that are from different backgrounds and, and being involved in, uh, in uh, pushing this trend ahead, which we'll see even further going forward. Um, I wanna say a bit about millennials as a bridge generation. We've talked about the racial generation gap or the cultural generation gap between the largely white older population and the, large, and the racial minority younger population. Uh, but millennials are kind of the bridge uh, in terms of their racial and ethnic uh, makeup. And I uh, want to give a little bit of a demography lesson here. Uh, this is 1980, and it's a population pyramid. Uh, back in 1980, there were no millennials yet, uh, but there were baby boomers. And if you look at baby boomers there, this population pyramid, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, uh, goes from the younger ages up to older ages. There should be a label at the top that says 85 and over that's missing. And the size of each bar tells you the size of the population in each one of those age groups. So back in 1980, baby boomers who were then ages 16 to 34 made up a third of the population. Again, being a baby boomer myself, I realized how important we were in terms of popular culture and uh, you know consumer base and, and all of that sort of thing even voting patterns, uh, certainly in the protests and so forth that were going on back then, uh, that as they were younger, I think it's, it, it's understandable why baby boomers got gotten so much attention and continue to get that much attention. Let's move up to 2015. And you see by then, but baby boomers turned to be 51 to 69, still a little bit bigger as a generation than the generation ahead of it and the generation behind of it, behind it. But now they're millennials and millennials, uh, eight, at this point in 2015, we're 18 to 34. And it also is a little bit bigger than the generation ahead of it and the generations behind it. Uh, and so they have also gotten a lot of attention. But the other thing to note about millennials is their race and ethnic diversity. The yellow parts of those age bars are the, uh, the parts of those populations that are people of color. So millennials have a much higher percentage of people of color than the, the generations uh, older than them but not as big as the generations younger than them, uh, which we're gonna see going forward. Here's another way to look at that. This is kind of another version of that chart, those charts I showed you earlier. Here we have the older, pop, older generations at the left, younger generations at the right. Uh, but the millennial population, uh, when this was done, ages 18 to 34, it was 56% white, uh, post-millennial 52% white, uh, largely, uh, baby boomers and people older than baby boomers, 75% white. But it's interesting to note that the Gen Xers, who broadly were age 35 to 54, uh, were about the same racial composition as the U.S. as a whole. So all the generations younger than Gen Xers are much more diverse and they're going to get much more racially diverse. Here's a chart which sort of hits a, a point I like to make about the millennial generation is that it has global attributes. 25% of millennials speak a language other than English at home. 16% speak Spanish at home, and a high percentage of them speak, speak two or more languages. 29% uh, of millennials are first and second generation Americans. Uh, that goes up to 70% for Latino millennials and 92% for Asian millennials. Uh, and 14% of millennials are in interracial marriage, or the marriages among uh, millennials 14% uh, of them are interracial. It was only 7% for baby boomers when they were that age. This is an important part of understanding the millennial generation and generations after them going forward though. And that is their educational attainment. I think it's very important to show that at the eight, when they were ages 25 to 34, millennials were more educated than either, either baby boomers or Gen Xers for each one of these major racial and ethnic groups. For example, for whites, only 27% of the baby boomers graduated from college when they were 25 to 34, and that shoots up to 43% for millennials. For Asians, 42% in in, among baby boomers, uh, uh, baby boomer Asians 
who graduated from college, and that's up to 63%. And for Blacks, it goes from 12% to 23%, for Hispanics from 9% to 17%. But it's important to see this huge gap, which still exists, even despite the fact we have improvement in educational attainment among all these groups between whites and Asians on the one hand, and Blacks and Hispanics on the other hand. It's especially important to keep in mind, given the fact that we know that Blacks and Hispanics together are going to make up about 40% of generation of the Generation Z population and the post-Generation Z population. And uh, it's something that means we need to do, and do what we can to invest further into these different groups' uh, educational uh, attainment patterns. A lot of these groups are in segregated, under-resourced school systems, uh, their parents may not have the wherewithal to loan them money to, for college tuition or for other expenses and so forth. So it does mean that we do have to pay attention to the educational attainment of the next generation and the generation after that. A lot of the funds and resources for that are not at the federal level. They're at the state and local level. Uh, so it's important that all levels pay attention to uh, doing what we can to make sure that that next generation, who, as we said before, is going to contribute a lot to our labor force growth. And we want them to be successful, uh, not just for their own sake, but for the nation's sake. And uh, this is a very important disparity to keep in mind. You know, this is the kind of stuff that's being uh, discussed right now at this very moment in Congress to how to deal with younger people, how to deal with general support, uh, uh, what we might call um, social infrastructure, I guess is what it's called. Here's another, here's another map which talks about uh, the racial composition of millennials in different states. Uh, and you can see there are 10 states where more than half of the millennial population um, are people of color in California and Nevada going down to Texas and Georgia, Florida and so forth. There's another 10 where more than 40% uh, uh, where, where millennials make up to, up to 40% uh, or at least 40% of the uh, of the millennial people of color are 40% of the millennial population. And then there's about eight states there where 80% of the millennial population is white. So the millennial population looks different in different parts of the country, but it's becoming more diverse everywhere. Here's a chart which shows uh, different metro areas, the racial composition of the millennial population. In Los Angeles, 27% of, of the millennial population is white. Over half of it is Latino. Uh, whereas in Chicago and New York, the combined black and Asian populations are as big as their Hispanic populations among millennials. And then there's, of course, Atlanta with a large African-American presence in the millennial population and Pittsburgh largely white. So you can see that this differs across the country, but again, becoming more racially and ethnic diverse. In fact, here we're looking at numbers uh, in 2025 that has uh, the uh, pre-millennial population, the millennial population, and the post-millennial population by race and ethnic uh, composition for Los Angeles, Atlanta, Chicago, and Minneapolis, St. Paul, although each of them um, have uh, different racial ethnic uh, makeups for their post-millennial, or for their, their pre-millennial population, which in fact are baby boomers and so forth, uh, they get more diverse over time, but probably at different levels. So this is happening everywhere. And I think it's important to understand that as we move ahead, uh, millennials um, are going to be, there's a 2020 population pyramid where the broadly the millennial population looks, is there. We, they moved to age 40 to 54 in 2035. And by the way, only about a third of the population will be older than them in 2035. I hope I'm still there to be part of it. And in 2050, uh, of course, they're going to be sort of in the upper part of the population, but the projections show that in each one of these years, they're still gonna be the bridge between uh, a less diverse America and a more diverse America. And they're, they're, they're therefore in a very important place in terms of as they move into positions of responsibility and business and politics, popular culture and so forth, uh, they'll be able to show and demonstrate how this diversity can be a strength of the United States to not only generations younger than them, but also to generations older than them. And that's where we're going in terms of our diversity. It's not just some snapshot. This is where we're going into the future. Now, I want to talk a little bit about diversity and presidential elections. And I'm going to do this in three parts because I think diversity started to have a big impact already between 2004 and 2016. Uh, the last George Bush election and the Trump election. 
uh, where he won in 2016. Then I'll say something about the 2020 election, what that sort of says, and then look a little bit about how racial demographics may affect uh, president, presidential elections beyond 2020. Here's a look at the race ethnic uh, profiles of eligible voters from 2004 up to 2020, really. Uh, took it all the way up today. And you can see it goes from 75% white. These are eligible voters, people age 18 and over uh, who were citizens. 75% uh, white in 2004, down to 66.9% white in 2020. Bigger increases uh, for the Latino population, especially, uh, and um, from 8.2% to 13.5%. Of course, the eligible voter population is not as diverse as the population as a whole, because as we talked about earlier, it's the younger, sort of under age 18 population, which is much more racially diverse than this. But that's going to be changing over time. And so we're going to see they're making a bigger impact on the electorate and especially in certain states and in certain communities. This is something, again, now just looking at 2004 to 2016, this is something looking at a Republican, a Democratic minus Republican voter margin by race ethnicity. This shows the percent voting Democrat minus a percent voting Republican. So a positive number is a Democratic advantage, a negative number is a, is a Republican advantage. And uh, we break it down by uh, the different racial groups, how they voted in the 2004 to 2016 elections. Uh, let's focus on the black population, of course, says, the black population, by the way, has voted Democratic in every presidential ele election going back to 1936, and especially high levels since the first Johnson election in 1964. But you can see that in this group of uh, elections, the 2008 and 2012 elections, they made even higher uh, turnouts, or not turnouts, but margin. They also did turnouts. But this is voting margins of people who did turn out. And, uh, you know, largely, I think we can attribute to the first African-American president running for Democrats, and it's, it's come down a little bit for 2016, and we'll talk about 2020 in a minute. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is a very important part of the 20, 2008 and 2012 victory for Obama. We'll talk about it a little bit later. For Hispanics and Asians, still leaning Democratic or moving Democratic with their margins, uh, not as high as African-Americans. In fact, Asians voted Republican in the, the elections of the 1990s. Uh, but here again, in the 2008 and 2012 elections, uh, Hispanics moved upward toward the Democrats uh, prior to the, compared to the 2004 election. If you move over to the left and look at the white Republican margins, because they're negative, they voted Republican. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a smaller number, but you have to think about, you know, this is applied to a much bigger population base. So it's still a lot of votes, even though it's not as big of a, of a margin of those other groups. And you can see the 20, 2008 election was right in the middle of the Great Recession. Uh, this is when Barack, Barack Obama beat, uh, uh, won his first election. Um, you know, there was not as much uh, white Republican support as there was in other elections. But uh, you can see that in all of these elections, of course, the Republicans voted one in 2004 and 2016, the Democrats won in 2008 and 2012. But in all of these elections, the popular vote was taken by Democrats. <laughs> I want to talk about this because this is important for the racial generation gap or the, uh, the cultural generation gap. This shows, and this is for the 2016 election, Democrat minus Republican voting margins by age groups within race groups. So just sh shift your eye over to the right clump there. That's for the total population. And it has four bars for different age groups, the 18 to 29 and the 30 to 44, 45 to 64 and 65 and over. The underage 45 population voted Democratic. The overage 45 population voted Republican. This was the case not only in 2016, but also in 2012, 2008, 2004, and by the way, 2020. Uh, there's this sharp age divide between uh, these young folks and the older population. Now you might say part of that has to do with the racial composition of the younger population. It's much more minority because if you look at that middle clump, those are for the combined minority population and all, all those uh, margins are very strongly democratic for each of those four age groups in 2016. But it's still the case even for the white population if you shift your eyes over to the left for those same four age groups. Although whites in 2016 voted uh, Republican for all age groups, it was not very strong for the 18 to 29 year old age group and not as strong for the uh, 30 to 44 year olds it is for the older age group. So there's some combination of race involved with this, but there's all this kind of age issue too. Younger whites uh, somewhat in their voting patterns 
uh, less Republican uh, than older whites, uh, but in general, the older population uh, tends to vote Republican. So let's talk about the Electoral College for these years. Uh, first, we'll go from 2004 to 2012. Uh, and of course, the red states are the ones voted, uh, the red states are those ones voting Republican or for the Republican candidate, which would have been George W. Bush in 2004 and Obama's, uh, Obama's, um, uh, <clears throat> Obama's uh, competitors in 2008 and 2012. 2004 is a kind of an old Republican model. And it shows that the Republicans took the South, it took the good, good part of the Mountain West, good part of the Great Plains state. And, and over the, the years, that's usually the states Republicans tended to take. Uh, used to call it the, the solid Democratic South, but by then it was a solid Republican South, except for elections where a Southern Democrat was running like Bill Clinton or Jimmy Carter, he would pick off some Southern states. Uh, and, and so, you know, the Democrats took the coastal states and a lot of the industrial states. But in 2008 and in 2012, Democrats started moving into the South instead of moving into the West in states like Florida and Virginia and Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, and in 2008, North Carolina. Uh, and that has a lot to do with the uh, changing demography of those states and also the very strong support for the Democratic candidate, in this case, Barack Obama, among the racial minority groups. You'll look that some of those blue states are dark blue and some of them are light blue. The light blue states are states where the minority populations voted Democratic, Republican populations voted Republic, the, the white populations voted Republican, but the Democrats still won largely because of the Democrats, their changing demography and their strong uh, democratic support. And that is even in states like Ohio or Michigan or Pennsylvania, the, it's the minority population that, that won it for Obama in 2008 to 2012. Here's 2016, well, what happened? We had all this diversity. We had all of this movement uh, toward the Democrats. Trump won, and he won uh, to a large degree because he took Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, uh, as well as Ohio and Florida and a few other places. Um, and here, even though the demography has been the same, Trump was able to kind of get a lot more support for the so-called white, blue-collar um, uh, voting bloc. Uh, and uh, I would say that although the demography is changing, that Obama overperformed with his base in 2008 and in 2012, whereas Trump overperformed with the Republican base in 2016. In other words, although the demography is changing, but it's still the, the candidate and whatever people are voting for makes a big difference in all of this. Let's look at the 2020 election. Now, lo and behold, the Democrats come back. They take those states, at least Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, also uh, Arizona and Georgia. And uh, so what's happened there? Well, I would say that a little bit of each happened, that there, because of the changing demography in Arizona and Georgia, you know, the black bat population moving to Georgia, much more a Latino population in, in Arizona. Uh, and of course, uh, the candidate was popular as well, uh, helped the Democrats in those states and in those other states Actually, uh, Biden did a little better than Trump with the sort of white blue collar population. Trump still won them, but not by nearly as much and still did quite well with the minority populations. Here's a couple of uh, margins by race for 2016 and 2020, uh, Democrat minus Republican margins. Uh, uh, they're not all that different. I mean, you'll read a lot, and this is from what's called the uh, exit polls that were done by a media consortium. There are many other polls that have been taken, including the Pew Research Center has done one with validated voters that have come up with somewhat different numbers. But broadly, you still see uh, the racial minority groups voting Democratic, whites voting Republican. Much has been made about the lower Hispanic vote for, for Democrats this time, but it's still pretty strong. Uh, but, and we see that occurring at the same way and a little less white Republican vote this time, a minus 17 versus minus 20. Other polls show that the difference is even greater, even, even bigger chunk uh, went toward the Democrats. Uh, so that's part of the problem, that's part of the issue. And again, as we've talked before, the under age 45 population once again voted Democratic, the uh, over age 45 population voted Republican. I'm gonna skip through some of this. And I wanna talk a little bit about the 2020 census. Uh, the 2020 census, uh, oh, hang on. I do wanna talk about this before I get to the 2020 census. These are projections 
uh, showing the race ethnic composition of the eligible voter population, both actual in 2016 and projected for 2028 for the 18 to 29, 30 to 44, 45 to 64 and 65 and over populations. Look to the right side of this and look at the size of the eligible voter population age 65 and over and how it increases from 2016 to 2028. Baby boomers moving into this age group and a lot of white baby boomers moving into this age group. But when you look into the younger part of the population, that's getting a little bigger, too. Not quite as big, uh, but it's becoming much more racially diverse. So, I mean, what we need to think about going forward is, you know, are we still going to have this cultural generation gap going on and still parties trying to divide the country and trying to understand what's going on? Or are people going to understand that it's these younger people who are going to be entering the labor force, who are going to be uh, contributing to the country's well-being and productivity and integration into a global economy? Uh, and will both parties come to understand this and try to deal with different kinds of measures and different kinds of issues uh, than this cultural divide that we've seen in a lot of the recent elections? Now I want to talk about the 2020 census and just a little bit because they're going to throw me off the stage here in a little bit. Uh, the 2020 census has part of it has already been taken. Normally, the 2020 census, most of the results would have been out by now. But of course, because of the pandemic and because of some lawsuits and other things going along, uh, what should have been initially been put out at the end of December, which are the final results of how many people live in each state, uh, was uh, shifted to the end of April. And I think with good reason, I think it allowed the Census Bureau to do a careful job because of the pandemic issues. And what would also be, by now we would have the race ethnic makeup of the whole United States and all the small areas in the United States. We're not gonna, what's called the redistricting file, which is used to create uh, uh, congressional and legislative districts, but also for general information. That will come out in the middle of August. One of those, one of those products and other products having similar information will come out later in the fall. So I can't tell you the results of the race stuff from the 2020 census, but I can show you that the overall population growth in 2010 to 2020 is the second slowest growth we've ever had in the nation's history, only uh, beaten by the Great Recession between the Great Depression in, 20, in 1930 to 1940, and it's only a little higher than the Great Depression. And why is that? We have uh, more birth, we have fewer births, more deaths, lower immigration this decade. Some of it is part of a broader trend. Uh, towards lower births and more deaths because we're an aging population. Some of it had to do with the impact of the Great Recession on millennials putting off having children uh, and all, a little bit having to do with the pandemic, although the pandemic you know, occurred just right before the census. Uh, so that wouldn't have affected births up through April the 1st, 2020. But still, uh, at least people planning them up to that point. Uh, and, and immigration uh, was not a big uh, decade for immigration either, both because of the Great Recession and also some of restrictions by the previous uh, presidential administration. Uh, but still, we're at slow growth and we're going to have slow growth going forward. 37 states grew more slowly in the 2010s than they did in the 2000 to 2010 period. Uh, three states, Illinois, uh, West Virginia, and Mississippi actually lost population. Most of the faster gaining states tended to be in the Pacific, tended to be in the West and in the Mountain West, but Florida and Texas were also kind of fast growing states too. The, the reason they take the census by the Constitution is to reapportion Congress. And these are the states gaining seats. All of them uh, are in the South and West, Texas gaining two and a bunch of others, including Florida and North Carolina in the South and Colorado, Montana and Oregon in the West gained one. And states losing seats, California for the first time ever lost a seat. Uh, California population grew in the last decade, but at the slowest growth in its history. Uh, at the same point, another state that's technically in the South, West Virginia, lost its seat. And all the other states are in the North somewhere, especially a, a swath of state going from Illinois through Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York. Uh, and you would say, well, this might affect, uh, you know, the Republicans help the Republicans along. But if you look at some of the states that are gaining seats, they're, they're kind of purple states. I think Texas could turn purple or, or even Democrat in the next couple of elections. Florida is sort of on the fence. Colorado is a blue state already. And, uh, you know, Oregon, as well as Oregon and North Carolina could also be a purple state. Uh, at the same point, over the last three censuses, uh, big gains were taken altogether by Texas 
and Florida and Nevada and Colorado. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not clear who's gaining. So that's why part of this Obama taking a lot of the South and a lot of the West is a kind of important and the kind of the racial demographics of those regions are important for the Democratic Party. Another part of what we're going to see later in the census is the changing age ratio growth of different age groups. Here we have them going well, for that 10 year period, 2010 to 2020. This is taken from the Census Bureau's demographic analysis estimates. Uh, and you can see it's the older population that's growing. Uh, the people over age 55 are growing 20 times faster than the people under age 55, according to these estimates. And there's only sort of big sort of impact of growth is for those millennials during the decade, which moved into the 25 to 34 year old age group. But for the younger age groups, we might even see a decline uh, when we get the results from the 2020 census coming out uh, in the next, next few months. So we're becoming stagnating in our growth. We're becoming older as a population, but we're also becoming racially more diverse. These are annual census estimates going from 2010 to 2020. Put out, they're not the census, they're put out by the Census Bureau. And we show them there 10 numbers for those 10 years for each of these different racial ethnic groups. But, but I highlight the whites for the last four years, the census estimates show there's a decline in the nation's white population. Remember, I showed that will be a projected decline over the next several decades, uh, but this has already shown up. We don't know if this decline is just temporary uh, during this period because of uh, the recession and stuff like that, bad fertility, uh, low fertility, uh, high deaths, uh, but it's, it's part of what's going on. And in fact, uh, most of the growth we're going to see when the census results come out, maybe all of the growth will be from people of color, especially Latinos might account for about half of the U.S. growth. Asians might account for about three, uh, one quarter of the U.S. growth over the last decade. Uh, so, and, and this will be especially the case among the younger population. So we're going to see with the census a stagnating growth, an aging of the population, and diversity, racial diversity, especially among the younger parts of our population. And this will spread all over the country. Uh, and these results will be coming out in a few, in a few weeks. Uh, I just want to end by saying that, um, you know, I think this country is at a, a very important stage. Uh, in, in many ways, we're much better than a lot of the countries of Eastern Europe or Japan that have not gotten immigration, that have a much faster aging population than us, even declines in their labor force age population. We've been lucky because of the last several decades, we've had immigration to the US people from Latin America and Asia and other parts of the world because immigrants and their children are younger than the US native population. It's made our population more robust. We're still aging, but not nearly as rapidly as those places are. But the important thing we need to understand is that we have to invest in these younger groups and their younger groups are much more racially and ethnically diverse, have different needs, and we need to think about that moving forward. So I'm going to stop there and uh, we'll let uh, uh, the rest of the, flow, the show flow on. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Mike Grizzard, a member of the Program Selection Committee for the Summer Lecture Series here at Osher at Dartmouth. Welcome back to the second half of this morning's program entitled The Changing Face of America. This segment will feature a conversation between this morning's speaker, Bill Frey, Fry, excuse me, and the Brookings Institute and Devera Cohn, senior writer and editor at the Pew Research Center located in Washington, DC. Dee's specialty is population dynamics and demography in the United States, for which she was the lead reporter for the Washington Post in the 2000 census. Bill, welcome back. Dee, welcome, over to you. Thank you. This is a great presentation by Bill. Um, I've been learning and listening to him since the 1990s when I was covering the census and demographic issues for the Washington Post. And then later in my career at the Pew Research Center, uh, he always has a lot of interesting things to say and I'm hopeful that our Q and A will bring out even more interesting uh, facts and dialogue with the audience. We already have a really bunch of good questions in the queue and I'd, I'd like to just dive into them. We have a number of questions on race, which is always a conundrum and, a, and, and I think confusing for a lot of people, uh, sometimes for demographers as well. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, just to start things off, you know, what is the definition of race? This comes from um, Hillary Lorellan Thomas. What are these differentiations based on? 
uh, what is the scientific basis for uh, making differentiations about race? And then we also have, I'll just throw this in as a secondary, a second question from Peter Fahey, what are the requirements to be classified as Hispanic? Yeah, well, um, Dee, I'm so glad to join you in this conversation. As you say, we've been talking a long time about these issues and uh, I follow your work as well over all the years at the Pew Research Center and feel free to uh, correct me if I get anything wrong uh, or add to it. Uh, I think, um, you know, this is, that's a fund fundamental question about what is race. I mean, I think people have written books about classifications of race. It's changed over time. I think a lot of people think race now is a social construct. Uh, it used to have be involved with, you know, skin color and eugenics and stuff like that in, in, in olden days. Uh, but right now, um, I think, you know, the racial groups that we see in the census, which are, I don't know if I can remember them all, it's white, black, uh, Asian, Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander, uh, American Indian, or Alaska Native, um, are people, you know, some combination of the old racial sort of skin color type of origin uh, and a social construct that people want to be identified as. Um, and, you know, they come from a lot of discussions. Uh, they're really the product of this discussions and meetings of the Office of Management and Budget who come up with the official racial classifications that are used in the census. Um, every 10 years or 20 years, they uh, sort of radically change something or another. Hispanics were not a cat. I'll talk about Hispanics in a minute, but but even Asians were a different kind of category earlier. I mean, you would instead talk about um, uh, Chinese or uh, so forth. Uh, uh, the black population, uh, I would say, has had a, a very um, you know, unfortunate, it's a, I guess the kind way to say it, history in the United States, going back to our days of slavery and so forth, when slaves were only counted three-fifths of a person in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, uh, slaves were not a particular race category, but early censuses did talk about free persons of color and free persons who were white. And so it had that kind of stigma to it, trying to account Blacks as of something other than trying to glorify or hoping to uh, emblemize the black population, but somehow segregate them in a lot of ways. For many years, uh, there were categories like octoroons, uh, <laughs> for example, depending on your mixed race heritage, something called a one drop rule. If you had some small black piece of blood in your history, you were, you were counted as a, as a black person and, and, and in not a, a good way in terms of the kinds of how the government perceived you or how other peoples perceived you. All of that has changed, I think, uh, since the civil rights years, and maybe a few, a few, a decade or two before the civil rights years, uh, where people understood that we needed to make a, a, an understanding of different racial groups have not benefited as well uh, over time in terms of their economic status, in terms of their opportunities, and so forth. So a lot of the civil rights legislation, affirmative action legislation, uh, asked that the Census Bureau put in those racial categories that could be most useful for those purposes. And that's why uh, when the Office of Management and Budget convenes committees, interagency inter committees, and also review committees that are made up of advocates for different racial and ethnic groups, uh, that kind of discussion is what brings the race uh, classification that we have today. Uh, I wanna say a little bit about Hispanics uh, because Hispanics, uh, at least in the last couple of censuses, really since the Hispanic term was entered, I think in the 1980 census, uh, it's a separate question than race. I think only sociologists understand why. I think the average person doesn't quite understand why Hispanic status should be one question and the race question should be another question because it's very confusing since a lot of the government uh, programs and policies that deal with affirmative action and, and like you know, voting rights and whatever, uh, consider Hispanics to be the same kind of categories as Blacks and as Asians. Why aren't Hispanics in the same question as that? Uh, but you have a separate question on Hispanics and then a lot of Hispanics get to the race question on the census and they say, well, I've already filled this out. Why do they wanna know more? And some of them by default write down white, some of them by, by default write down some other race, some of them write down two or more races. Uh, and, and because we have kind of fraught statistics about uh, multiracial Hispanics this way, and, and the Census Bureau had uh, asked 
to change that classification for the 2020 census to just have one question and not call it race, but call it origins and put in the standard race questions that we have now. And then also add another category for Hispanics that you could then choose which of those categories you want it or be multiple race. I mean, since 2000 census, you can choose different racial categories, but because now we have a Hispanic category, which people think the Census Bureau early in earlier years thought should be separate from the race category. It's very hard to combine all of this. In my research, like many other people, I include Hispanics as, as being essentially a race, but because of this fraught way the Census Bureau does it, I have to say, well, you're either Hispanic, and if you're not Hispanic, then you're these other racial groups. It's hard to be able to figure out people who are both are Hispanic and some other race for the two race questions. Uh, that's probably more than you needed to know about this, but to answer your main question is, how do you know if you're Hispanic or not? You get to decide. I mean, there's no real guidance. I guess you could look into the census website and they would give you some guidance, but when you get the form, you just get a chance to decide whether you're Hispanic or not. Tends to be people who are uh, have some kind of Spanish speaking ancestry. I mean, but it's for you to decide if, if you have enough kind of Hispanic uh, Latino uh, you know, connection in your family, with the, the, the nature that you speak Spanish and, and, uh, and all of that, or maybe a Hispanic parents or Hispanic, one of your parents is Hispanic. You can decide whether you're Hispanic or not. Uh, and that certainly is kind of a, it's an ethnicity, it's a context. And the other, the other years are the context too. So I would say the difference between the olden days when there was a race question, which was done in a kind of pejorative way against blacks, I would say, and, and the new post-civil rights way of putting race on the question. This is a chance to kind of, you know, celebrate your racial classification category and also use it for government programs to help uh, reduce inequalities. Yes, in fact, to look back at, at a little census history that might be helpful to our audience, really until 1960, the census takers were the ones who classified people by race. After 1960, you chose self-identity was the rule. So anyone can decide for themselves what race they want to be. And uh, back in 2010, in fact, uh, the president at the time, Barack Obama, whose mother was white and father was black, said that he checked the black box on the census form, as was his right. So really, uh, self-identity is what prevails on the census. Uh, and that, that may make the racial lines even more sort of malleable and fuzzy. Um, and I guess along those lines, Bill, I wanna throw a question at you of my own that we've talked about a little bit. Uh, there certainly are some social scientists, uh, most prominently uh, Richard Alba, who talk about how the multiracial population may help change the racial dynamics of this country because they have one foot in different racial camps, if you will. Um, and that especially uh, when it comes to the, the white population, he's suggesting that people who are white and another race might in some ways become a bridge between the white population and other groups, helping to sort of soften some of the racial divisions. What do you, what do you think of that? that well, I agree. I agree that uh, the hopeful view of America that I have, and in my book, Diversity Explosion, I have a whole chapter on this, uh, is one that's becoming much more mixed race, that the, the rise of multiracial marriages uh, and including Hispanics as a race, so Latino and white marriages, which are about 45% of all marriages, uh, will help people to sort of think of themselves as Americans rather than a different racial or ethnic group. Uh, I think the idea of being white, it used to be, you know, to be an American was you were white. <laughs> that, that was being American. You were white. And, that, and new, new groups would come to the United States. And how can I be American? How can I be white? I think in the future, uh, that's not going to be the case. I think there will, there will be this mixing going along. And, uh, but we aren't there yet. And, in, and, 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 the reason, and, and I think, therefore, it's important to keep these racial categories to be able to understand those kind of disparities that I talked about before, disparities in education or disparities in income and disparities of opportunities of various kinds, and the kinds of laws that are there to help to reduce those disparities. We need to know uh, something about people's backgrounds, which they identify themselves, uh, and how they're going to be able to deal that. So when we get to a situation where we're much more of a mixed race, we're a much more fluid country, I do think this kind of, you know, various permutations of different ways. I was, I was looking at the census uh, form last night for the uh, 
the, the redistricting file, which is going to come out in a few weeks. Redistricting file is the census file that comes out with race information for all of the blocks and census tracts and communities in the United States and can be used by states to re redistricting. And the reason they have race on there is because of the civil rights laws, the voting rights laws that said you have to have certain kind of racial representation to be able to draw those districts. Uh, but there is one category in there where you can identify that you are a member of six different racial groups. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many people do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're allowed to do that on the census. I don't think we're there yet in terms of, you know, lots of folks, but, but uh, I do agree that, that the goal is to become much more mixed race, not to, to become Americans, not to become white Americans. Mm -hmm. So you did mention disparities. And in that context, let me throw in a question from Rob Taylor, which is what services will be needed by rising numbers of black, Hispanic, or multiracial populations? Uh, suggest education, skills, training, and what else? Could you chat a little bit about, about well, that? Well, I can. I have a lot of very smart colleagues at the Brookings Institution that can answer that question a lot better than I can. I'm just a demographer. I just put these numbers out there and try to figure out what's going on. But I mean, I do think that it's important to, um, you know, make sure, I think we've seen in a lot of the policies that have come out of the proposed by the Biden administration, uh, to make sure that uh, there's uh, daycare, there's pre-K for people, there's paid family leave. I think education is not just putting the books in the schools, uh, but involves families to be able to have the opportunity, especially people who are just struggling. And then, and I, and I do think these disparities as, as a result of the pandemic could likely widen, uh, to be able to provide those kinds of you know, what we call them social infrastructure support for people uh, that especially goes to people of color. I'm not the person to say how to implement them. If I was, I would be in the White House right now, but I'm not. So uh, that those that's the that's the broad dimensions, I think, that we need to start thinking about, uh, you know, in addition to being able to give everybody the opportunity to get to a college if they, you know, if they're if they're deserving or to get funds for a scholarship if they're deserving and all of that. Uh, but I think in, it, it goes even further down to the earlier years, uh, to the young, to the toddler years and to the to the younger education years, K, K through 12 years and so forth. And it involves putting more resources into schools in an equal way, but also involves uh, help for the families themselves to be able to sustain, uh, they have their children be able to, to move upward uh, and not have to rely only on their parents' support, but get some government resources as well. And of course, as your numbers show, the, the child population is, or your numbers taken from census projections, the child population is either stagnant or potentially declining, while of course the older population is growing rather quickly. Um, and in fact, there's a Wall Street Journal story out there that's generating some buzz that's suggesting that uh, the US population overall actually declined for the first time um, with so many uh, counties experiencing more deaths than births. Can you address that? Or are we turning into Japan, for example? Um, no, we're not turning into Japan. I think that um, the, the country is going to, uh, this last year, the Census Bureau showed their most recent estimates the, the lowest annual growth rate uh, since at least 1900 and probably before then, but they didn't have annual statistics that they kept very well before then, 0.35% uh, uh, of the population grew. Where you'd like to have a population growth, about 1% is pretty nice. Uh, and it has been for some of the more recent decades where we got into that sort of situation. Uh, uh, so the couple things in this last, there's a broader term, let me talk about the broader term first, and that we're an aging population, and that we have, uh, which means we have an older population, even though we have a lot of youth coming in from immigration and such, it's getting older, and as a result, there are more deaths, uh, there are fewer births, because there are proportionately fewer in the women in their childbearing ages than there used to be, so even if the actual birth rates stayed the same, the number of births that that occur aren't as much, but actually the, the birth rates are going down a little bit, and some of it has to do, uh, you know, with people, especially women wanting to spend time with their careers and so forth. The most recent fertility data show that the birth rates are up for people in their late 30s, but down for people in their 20s and early 30s and teens. Uh, so after a while, you run out of time <laughs> after putting off having those births. Uh, and that's that's part of the situation as well. Uh, so I think those are things that are going to continue as a population ages. 
Uh, and then, of course, this last year, we don't quite know if we're going to have a decline in the population or not, but it, it's not going to grow very much this next year after the 0 0.35 last year because of the more deaths during the pandemic uh, and fewer births. And also immigration has been down. That's, that's the big thing. The main thing that is going to help us in the future, as has helped us up, up until the recent past, is the immigration. And uh, even because our natural, incre our natural increase is going to get lower, for reasons I said, the aging population. So we need external you know, folks to come in to help our growth. And, and immigrants and their children have a, have a younger age structure than the rest of the population. And uh, you know, we didn't have a good decade for immigration, partially for economic reasons, partially because of restrictions in this Trump administration, partially because of the pandemic. But I think that we need to have, I would propose if they made me the president, I would say we ought to have a national immigration council, sort of like the Federal Reserve Board that ought to sit down every couple of years and say, how many people do we need in the, in the US to make this country successful economically, culturally, of course, keep the family reunification because that's a very important, important part of our, our immigration law. But, um, you know, to promote, you know, immigration in a good way, uh, rather than to talk about immigrants as they're sometimes stealing something from us, which has been part of some of the recent politics. But I think we're going to get that. I mean, you're going to have to look at the numbers and it'll be hit you right in the face. We need to have more immigration going forward. And that'll keep us from aging quite as rapidly as we're aging now and keep us sort of ahead of these other countries like Japan or Italy or Eastern Europe. Uh, well, let me talk a little bit with you then about, about immigration, uh, since it's a, an important part of, of what you've presented, and we also have some questions about it. Um, Jim Wilson is asking uh, for a little more information about the strong opposition to both immigrants and non-whites. Um, you know, I can certainly say from our own work at Pew Research, we've seen a softening in opposition to immigration. We've asked a standard question, are immigrants a burden or a strength to the country? And while in the 1990s, more people said immigrants were a burden. Now we have more people saying immigrants are a strength to this country. But can you talk a little bit more about what's behind some of the concerns about immigration and also about uh, racial diversity? Is it based on jobs, other factors? Is it, as he puts it, basic white supremacy in action? Well, I mean, I, I'll be pretty, um... I don't usually talk about politics because I'm a demographer and I like to make sure that what I talk is based on my numbers coming out of the census and so forth. But I don't think the Trump administration has done us any favors with respect to helping to uh, integrate people into this country and to have an understanding of what uh, younger people, people of color and immigrants mean for our future. Uh, I should have sent a copy of my book to him before he took office. Perhaps that might have helped him understand some of this stuff a little bit better. Um, but I think it's been politicized way beyond what any of the facts have shown. So, you know, people of that political messaging like, like folks to think that the reason they're losing their jobs is because immigrants are coming across the border and taking them for, from them. National Academy of Science has put out a report, I think, four years ago, which clearly says that that's not the case. I mean, these are top economists that looked at this very carefully uh, and said that, you know, this is not the case at all. I mean, in some very selected kinds of occupations, this may be happening for a short term. Uh, but but uh, so I mean, so I think the race aspect of it is a piece of it. I think that, you know, that, that I think Trump once said he would need more immigrants from Norway. Well, you know, we could bring the whole country of Norway here. I'm not sure it would help the labor force that much. But but I think that 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 uh, the, the racial aspect of it, I think, is something has been politicized. And, uh, you know, I'm very sorry to see the the. the you know, people buying into this kind of message because it doesn't have anything to do with the facts and uh, people vote on the basis of, of uh, some, you know, kind of fake idea about, about what, what immigrants mean for this country. The demography is very clear about what they do mean. Uh, and as I say, you, you could have an immigration commission that looks carefully at, you know, the kinds of immigrants we need to bring in, what skills they should have in both low skills and high skills, and also to, to maintain the family reunification that's a long part of our history. And that would be a way to sort of deal with, uh, maybe, and also maybe publicizing this to the rest of the population, why this is so important. Uh, so I, I don't have a good answer, except I thought, I think politics has taken this over. Uh, and, I, you know, I mentioned Trump's name, but he, he's just caught on to something that was out there anyway. And, it's, and he and others have tried to fan that kind of idea. And, and it's not, a, it's not a, a true one. 
So let's switch topics a little bit, uh, perhaps talk a little bit about the 2020 census. And then we also have a number of questions about moving and migration. And I want to get to some of those before the end of the session. But uh, you know, you've talked some about concerns uh, about the 2020 census. And uh, we, we have at least one question from Brian Edwards. How confident are you that the 2020 census numbers will be sufficiently accurate for fair comparison? So we've, we've certainly are already seen some protests from people in Texas who expected to get a third congressional seat and people in Arizona who thought they'd get one more than the census gave them and Florida, I believe also. Uh, and then we've also had, of course, from uh, at groups advocating for communities of color, a lot of concern that their populations might've been undercounted due to uh, the pandemic and some of the concerns about Trump administration uh, questions on, on the census. So why don't you talk some about what you think will be coming out and what, what concerns you might have about accuracy and quality? Well, I should say, first of all, that I think the Census Bureau has had a huge challenge and they've tried as hard as they could to meet it. I mean, I know the people at the Census Bureau for many years. Uh, they're, you know, top statisticians. They understand how to, they're probably the best organization in the world to do this kind of work. And they have a lot of experience with it and they understand how to count people and they understand when there's a problem, you know, what problems, what, what solutions might work and, and they try their level best to deal with it. But they've really been up against a huge, uh, you know, one, two punch in this last year, the pandemic, which came, came about a month or so, or really only a few weeks in big numbers before the actual census date, which is April 1st, 2020, you know, affected all kinds of migration, college towns, homeless people, uh, people in group quarters. Uh, so, uh, you know, they then tried to uh, extend the period with which they were going to do the follow up to the census, a non response follow up to the census. Uh, normally, and, and, and that takes several months. When you know, they, once they get all the, the the sort of the internet responses and, and mail responses in, then they know who hasn't filled it out because they have some idea where all the houses are, and then they go back and try to follow up with all those houses. And you know, that takes several months. And then they decided, well, they were going to extend it even further. We should have gone through the end of July of 2020, and they wanted to take it through the end of October of 2020. Uh, the Trump administration wanted them to hurry things up so they you know you can't do it that fast you can, so they they were sort of a little stuck for that uh and and then after they get all that information then they try to deal with uh you know duplications computer errors those sorts of things maybe following up with people in local communities about how things have gone uh and and all of this you know the pandemic has just made it much worse uh, another issue that also occurred during the Trump administration was uh, the Trump and his uh, his uh, Secretary of Commerce wanted to put a, a citizenship question on the census. Uh, and in the past, there you know there 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 hasn't been in recent censuses a citizenship question uh, that was given to any, everybody that everybody had to fill out it was on, on something called the long form that used to be part of an older census, but it was never on the census in recent days that everybody should fill out. And it's well known that since we have a large number of not just undocumented people, but people who are here legally, but maybe are related to undocumented people, live in the same neighborhoods as undocumented people, are fearful they themselves would be accused of being an undocumented person, uh, did not want to fill out this question on the census because it would raise some kind of red flag about their neighborhood or their town. And it's well known, even with surveys done by the Census Bureau, that uh, anything like that on a, on a government official will, will keep people from filling it out. Uh, so, you know, that was kind of a red flag. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, pushed that away, uh, sort of, and, and then the Commerce Department decided to pull away from that. So there was not a citizenship question on the census, but there was still this idea in the minds of many people that it was there. And so before they even saw the census, sort of one of the, the, the argument is that they would shy away from it. Now, of course, there are lots of groups that are um, advocacy groups all around the country, different states have, have sponsored them and different organizations have sponsored them to go out and tell the Latino community or any other community that this is okay, that you really should fill out the census because this is useful to you. This is gonna give you representation, it's gonna be funds, it'll give you votes, all of this kind of thing. And as, and, you know, as the redistricting patterns go on. Uh, and, and we don't really, I mean, the, the real answer is, I don't think we can say yet. The idea that Texas thought they were going to get two seats 
instead of one seat or Florida thought they were going to get or we're going to get three seats instead of two seats and Florida thought they were going to get two seats instead of one seat. We really don't know that yet. And and uh, why that is or those are all based on estimates and estimates are also wrong. The, the very worst estimate that Census Bureau puts out is in the 10th year after the previous census. So, I mean, you know, the census is, estimates are only based on the census 10 years ago. So we don't really know if those estimates were correct. Uh, the Census Bureau says they're 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 trying carefully to figure out what what went wrong. It's certainly not going to be a perfect census. No census is a perfect census. The 2010 census was a pretty good census, and it still undercounted a little bit Latinos, undercounted blacks, undercounted children under one, under five, undercounted renters to some degree. Not a lot, not by a lot, but when you look at it in a national standpoint, it's not a lot. Maybe in some local areas, it is a lot, and so. That happens in every census. This one, there might be more holes <laughs> than there was before. The real question is if the big numbers, uh, like the state totals or the state, you know, for counties or for bigger numbers like that, how good are they going to be? And uh, I'm willing to sort of wait to see what the Census Bureau puts out because they're doing a lot of in navel gazing themselves they do something called a post census enumeration survey that they've already started they go back to people uh who should have gotten the census form and then ask them uh you know what they filled out or what they didn't fill out and they they do that after every census and that helps them to understand these kind of under enumerated populations so um you know we'll just kind of have to wait and see uh, there are probably going to be big pockets of places that are not they haven't done as well as they might and, uh, you know, they may decide to figure something else out. Interestingly, I saw um, something that came out a day or so ago that uh, they said, well, may, uh, the, the acting director put something out yesterday saying something, well, the census is going to be good enough for redistricting, but they may go back and do some uh, re-estimation for put out their population estimates next year. So the population estimates actually may be uh, somewhat better than the census. So the population estimates don't have nearly as much data, but they give you data for states and counties and things like that. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. But uh, I'm not going to be someone that points a finger at the census period. They've, they've had a lot to deal with, and I think they're doing very well. Well, thank you for that vote of confidence. Uh, <laughs> Somebody asked uh, about what do you think of the citizenship question, which you've already addressed, but also asked if you were in charge, how would you change the census process and questions? I think that that's, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's inviting you know, a, wide, a wide response, whatever you want to say. Uh, I, I guess as context, let me just point out that the census has been moving more and more in the direction of what's called administrative records, which is using existing government records to fill in information that they don't get from respondents themselves. So for example, in the Canadian census, uh, they actually use information from your income tax form to um, fill in your income information. You don't provide it. Um, and the Census Bureau has, in this census, I think used more government records than it ever has. And there are some people who are advocating even an all record census, or at least take as much of a census as you can using only government records, which gives you accurate information for about 90% of the population. And then you have to bother people a lot less to provide their own information, which a lot of people just are tired of doing for surveys. They, they just wanna be left alone. Anyway, Bill, what would you do? Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably worthwhile to do some more research to understand the administrative record approach, who it covers, who it doesn't cover, who it's likely, even with the add-on to like a mini census for the non-covered people, what that would do. I mean, I this is my, the sixth decennial census I've analyzed. So uh, I tend to like the old way. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and so uh, until it's proven to me that, uh, you know, it doesn't work that you're going to, I mean, and I don't think you can count this pandemic year as a good test of whether it works or not, because I think this is this huge challenges during this year. But, you know, if they, I think they made a big stride this year. And, and luckily by allowing people to fill out the census on the internet, and uh, boy, it would have been horrible if they could, people couldn't do that during this pandemic. It's the first census where broad, broad use of internet response that the Census Bureau ever had. And uh, so I think, it, you know, I think there are ways that, that that kind of general approach is probably okay. And then you can still back it up with administrative records to see, you know, check accuracy of blocks and so forth like that. It's only once every 10 years and you have a lot of time to plan for it. 
Um, you know, as a demographer, I'd like to see them do it every five years, actually. We'd get as much more accurate data in, in, in five-year pe periods rather than 10-year periods. But the Constitution says every 10 years. You know, the, what the Census Bureau did after the 2020 census is to eliminate those long-form questions. It used to be up to 2010, up to 2000. Uh, everybody would get what's called the short form, which is just the, the same questions you got in the census this year, your age, your race, uh, your household, your relationship to the head of household and whether you're an owned or rented a home and another housing question or two. Uh, but then in addition to that, about 15% of the population got another 40 or 50 questions on all kinds of things, your occupation and, you know, language ability, and, you know, lots of things like that. Uh, which was very useful for all kinds of purposes, not just for government agencies, but it was used by the private sector uh, for all kinds of things. And that was done every 10 years. And, and, and after the Census Bureau decided, you know, that was just too much and too much for too big of a population. They instead instituted something called the American Community Survey, which for a much smaller part of the population, which gets done every year and has a lot of those questions on it and could be used for some of those purposes. So they've already kind of changed that to just give the basics and I think the basics are, are fine. You may want to play around a little bit with, are people going to be concerned about the citizenship question? I mean, they use the terms they use for different racial groups change over time, depending on what seems to be more acceptable to different, to, for those different groups, uh, the, the, how they see it identifying themselves uh, and that kind of thing. And it may be at some point, the race question may not be something they want to ask if, if we get to that nirvana where the race, we don't need to know people's race to be able to solve all the problems of our society. Uh, that's going to be a ways off, I think. So, uh, you know, I would stick with the same pattern. I would do a little more, you know, especially with the internet, you know, they can do much more with the internet. This is their first trial with it. And there's probably things they can fix about it and then do a little bit about the administrative record stuff. Uh, so I, I'd stay, I'd stay the same, I think, except maybe have one every five years. So Bill Fry, traditionalist. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, answer one question that was raised, which is, will you have access as a demographer to the results earlier than the public? And the answer to that is no, all the results for everybody at the same time. Um, so you, uh, anybody in the public can get the same access as demographers do to the to the uh, the detailed numbers. There are some researchers who uh, have to swear release any of this uh, information to anybody, and they can go into a secure facility and look at. It. But, but really, for the large detailed data, sets, everything is out there for the public to see. And in 2022, um, this is exciting news for family genealogists, um, the results from the 1950, individual results from the 1950 census will come out. The law says that census, individual census information is confidential for 72 years. Uh, but if you have something you wanna check up on from your family or from some other source for the 1950 census, those results will be released in, in 2022. Um, I know I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but let's turn now to uh, migration because there are a number of questions on that. And, and one of them is just an overall question of who moves and why. Do you wanna talk about that to set the table for other discussion we might have about migration? Yeah, I mean, other than when there is a pandemic, <laughs> people who move tend to move uh, largely for kind of life course related things or for economic motivations. In other words, people leave their parental home, go to college or maybe move in by themselves and then maybe get some roommates and then they'll decide they're gonna get married and they'll move in somewhere else and maybe they'll have a child and then they'll find a bigger house and they'll move somewhere else. Uh, so those kinds of moves uh, you know, tend to be clustered more for people in their late teens and 20s and early 30s. Mo if you look at all the moves in the United States, a very, I, I should know the percentage, but a very high percentage, maybe 40%, maybe 50%, something like that, 60%, are those groups. And, and that's any kind of move. It's not moving, you know, across. It's important to make a distinction between kind of moving for those kinds of reasons and moving locally compared to moving long distance, usually across metropolitan areas or across states. 
those moves are, are, are rare because the further away you move, there's fewer people do that. It's kind of a, an axiom about that. And those the moves are often made for economic reasons. In other words, the reason most people move for long distances from, say, from you know Buffalo to New York City or something like that is to get a job. And they think they can get a job at another place easier than in the, in the labor market they are in the metropolitan they are. Maybe they're offered a job somewhere else. And so those moves are... Um, you know, there, there's not as many of those moves in general over time. Uh, but the, the, the sort of the average move from house to house uh, is something, you know, it's a common part of American life. It's gone, the migration rate has gone down over time. Uh, and uh, it's gone down because, uh, you know, back in the 1950s, I think about 20% of the population moved every year. Now it's less than 10. It was last year, it was less than 10%. And part of that over time had to do with uh, back in those days, uh, most people rented. And so renters tend to move more than owners. Back then, the population was younger in age structure. So younger people move. So, so because it was a younger population, you saw more moves every year than, than this time. And also back then, used to be that there was a, uh, a family where the husband was the only uh, wage earner and the wife could sort of go along and the rest of the family would go along or maybe the, off, off sometimes maybe the woman was a single wage earner. And now if you're doing a long distance move, you've got to get jobs for both of them or maybe other people in the family. Uh, so it takes longer to find that kind of move. Uh, and some economists think, in fact, that uh, labor markets are more homogeneous than they used to be. And so you don't have to move as much to different labor markets. So that's another reason why long distance moves have gone down over time. But I would say lifestyle and life force moves, labor force moves, and then finally retirement moves, which aren't a lot of moves. Most people don't move when they're retired. I mean, there's a little uptick for people in their late 50s and 60s, but not to the same degree you see migration of people in their 20s and 30s. So that's the deal with migration. Now, this pandemic, I have no idea. I mean, the, the, the census statistics that I deal with are usually from uh, the current population survey, which asks annual moves every year, uh, or the American Community Survey, uh, and which has, does not yet have real numbers yet about during the pandemic year, and IRS data, which gives you information about uh, people moving across counties, and those not are, are not yet available for the year 2020. Uh, so it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, we know there's a lot of moving going on from real estate statistics and, and that sort of thing. I think some post office data have been out to look at that. But it's hard from those, especially the post office data, to know what are temporary moves or what are permanent moves. So it's kind of hard to know what all, how it's all going to shake out as a result of this pandemic. But beyond the pandemic, we've been showing lower rates of migration in the United States. Yes, yeah, so we've been doing some survey work, uh, actually asking people whether they moved due to COVID or other factors uh, during the pandemic. And so far we found that about 5% of Americans say they did relocate, either permanently or temporarily. A number of them have moved back. Moving was much more common among younger, younger adults. And a lot of them ended up moving into their parents' homes, either temporarily or permanently. Um, some because they could work remotely. And so it'll be interesting to see when schools reopen and when workplaces reopen this fall, if indeed they do, uh, whether people will move back to where they were or stay where they are. Um, I think the, pa the pandemic has upended a lot of residential patterns for at least a small number of people. Uh, let me turn now, there are a couple of factors that specific reasons for moving that, that people talked about in, in questions. And I'd like your opinion on both of them. One was climate change. Someone asked uh, how, how much of a factor is that uh, in, in moving? And then uh, another person asked how strong is the sorting factor? Uh, that is people moving to places that are more racially or politically homogenous and has that been changing? So do you wanna have a go at either one of those? Yeah, I don't know if I can say much about the climate stuff. I mean, I'm sure there are going to be parts of the country that will feel the effects of climate change you know, due to, you know, uh, water issues or, or heat issues and those sorts of things that, that will localize, you know, the ideas about who can move there, who wants to move there. But more from a broader perspective, I haven't, it's not something I've looked at to tell you the truth. There, there's certainly probably people looking at this. So I can't really say that, say much about that. The sorting thing, you know, Certainly the sorting by race, there's no question about that. Those high levels of racial segregation that we still have in the United States uh, show that some of that sorting is not voluntary, but it's still there. And, and uh, 
Uh, it's going down, especially among young people, especially in growing parts of the country, especially in places where there's other uh, a variety of racial groups, not just a place that's largely white and black and sort of sort of not growing very rapidly, like a lot of Midwest cities are. We see still very high levels of racial segregation. Uh, but um, you know, the, the idea about political sorting is kind of an interesting question. Uh, you know, our colleague Bill Bishop has written this book a few years ago about the, the big sort, how people would move to uh, neighborhoods where they're more likely to have people with the same more political views and voting patterns and so forth. I mean, that may be true. I tend to think, though, that bigger reasons for people to move are more bread and butter things, like the kind of job they're going to get, like the kind of house they want to live in, what sort of school system they want to have their children in. Uh, and that sort of thing. Now, it may be those latter views do coordinate with political views, but I would say those views come, I think that, those things come first uh, rather than the political uh, motivation first, that, that, that they're correlated maybe, but I don't think the political motivation is the main one. I think it has to do with more bread and butter kinds of motivations. Um, now, if I could ask you one voting question, which, which we got, uh, someone asks about gender differences in voting and especially among different racial and uh, ethnic groups. Is there anything uh, you can say about that and potentially might have changed? Yeah, I mean, I, I can say a little bit. I'm probably, you can say as much as me given all the work that Pew has been doing with your, with your, uh, with your uh, polling and so forth. I mean, uh, you know, black women are always seen as a very strong, source of democratic support tend to vote more democratic than black men they both vote democratic uh but black women vote more democratic uh in among the white population among college graduate white college graduate women tend to vote more democratic than white college graduate men uh it's not a big as big a difference for white non-college men and women uh and uh i can't say very much about the other groups but i think there is you know tendency for at least when you look at the broad brush that there's more democratic voting among women than among men but it depends on which group you're looking at and then let me just throw in one last i guess we'd call it a philosophical question from um, alan schnur if i've pronounced that right um is population growth always good can it go on forever will we eventually run out of places to live clean water resources etc I think that'll be our last question because we're wrapping up in a couple of minutes. Well, I guess it depends where you're talking about, what kinds of population growth you're talking about. Uh, as I say, here in the United States, we're going to be facing, if we do not have immigration, pick up a little bit with our lower fertility and higher mortality, uh, a, a real significant uh, a possibility, at least, we're going to have a decline in our labor force age population. And I don't think that's good. Now, it does depend on you know, are we investing in the, in the next generation, if they're immigrants or from somewhere else, be able to contribute when they go get into the labor force, that they're contributors rather than takers. And that, that depends a lot on us and how we prepare them in the future. Uh, but there must be examples of places that have survived well without population growth. But I think right now in the U.S. looking ahead, uh, we need to think about uh, some way to foster immigration growth among our younger population. Well, thank you, Bill. Any any uh, wrap up thoughts as we as we end this very interesting presentation? Is there anything? Well, no. I just it's, I'm very pleased to be able to to be here and to get all these good questions and have people uh, listen to this. I think you know demography is is a piece of a large puzzle of lots of things. You've heard from economists. You're going to be hearing political people and so forth as part of this series. So, I mean, I hope that I've been able to show you that there's a dimension that's demographic that fits into a lot of these issues that you're talking about and maybe contribute to that. Well, thank you for that presentation and thank, uh, I'd like to thank the audience for some great questions, certainly some that I wouldn't have thought of. So uh, again, it was a very lovely interactive event. And uh, I think I'll turn it over to our OSHA folks to wrap up. Thank you to our speaker, William Fry, and our moderator, Vera Khan. We hope you've enjoyed today's session. Next week, we'll hear from Julia Galat, Senior Policy Analyst 
U.S. Immigration Policy Program at the Migration Policy Institute. We hope to see you then.